are so happy and grateful for everything that is being kept alive of the Delphic spirit in these wondrous presentations from Edward and Zoe and now Gary. And this one in particular, as we have seized this day for the Delphic, we have gone from a statue to a statue that is garbed with the soul life and soul energy. And now the noima or the breath of life to be infused. So there's something of a wondrous progression. Although the life has been in us from the first moment Edward spoke to lead us, we see the divine continuity of which Isadora always speaks. And in welcoming dear Gary, so much from the beginning with his Mary and family and their institutions helping to lead and keep alive the Delphic flame. And we remember for a thousand years in the Asclepion sites, and there was one at Delphi, visitants, seekers would come and sleep overnight, encased in quarters over snakes. There, they were learning about rejuvenation, coming for advice and health, regeneration, and the shedding of skins. And likewise, we are here to shed the skin of something we have all experienced the last three years and no better way than Gary fellow in dental medicine to lead us in just breathe for the heart and health and life of it. Grateful to him now, we welcome Gary DeSanto Rose, doctor. Thank you very much, Jean, and welcome everybody. It's so great to get back together. In the session today, we're going to be talking about something that we all have very much in common. Um, if we don't have it in common, you're probably not listening to this <laughs> recording right now. And as we all breathe, um, and the important thing is how we breathe, how we breathe from birth, and what effects that various changes has on our breathing and how that affects our health as well. Um, how we breathe affects many things. It affects our growth and development as a child. It affects how we sleep at nighttime. It affects our cardiovascular system, uh, our, our blood pressure. It can affect our sugar metabolism. It can uh, cause adult onset diabetes if we're not breathing properly at nighttime. Um, it can cause gastric reflux or acid reflux. And a lot of my patients will come in and we'll take the medical history and, and see what medicines they're on. And you begin to get put together these clues. And I'm gonna show you some clues today that you can look at for either yourself, your family members, uh, grandchildren, uh, and begin to get a little better understanding, particularly if early intervention can be taken place uh, because that's, that's the best place to uh, begin to recognize the problem and, and intervene before it becomes a, a larger problem. Um, it also affects our ability to concentrate as we will see in our the presentation that a lot of kids that are diagnosed with ADHD, uh, half of those kids actually have sleep disorder breathing problems. And just by improving their breathing techniques, uh, that will help their ADHD and, and get them off the medications that they can be put on. Uh, it helps us to stay calm or it helps us to become anxious. Uh, in the dental office, we have a lot of patients that come in anxious, of course, and they begin to change their breathing pattern. They begin to breathe their upper chest and very rapidly, like... <sighs> And what that does, as we will learn, is that we lose the CO2, which is very important. We'll be discussing a lot about our carbon dioxide. Uh, and it 
puts him into the, sets up the sympathetic nervous system, which puts him into what we call the fight and flight mode. So at nighttime when we sleep, we don't want to be going to fight and flight mode. We want to go into our parasympathetic system, which helps us to calm down, relax, and have a good night's sleep and get into the deeper stages of sleep that uh, are so beneficial uh, in many ways. So today uh, we had to cut down the, uh, the presentation uh, to an hour. So I want to make three key points today. And the first key point is that we all need to breathe less. Most of us need to breathe, breathe less. And we have to reduce our breathing volume. And by that, means, I mean that if you're breathing, say, 15 to 18 times a minute, and someone's breathing 6 to 10 times a minute, you are working two or three times harder. Uh, your lungs are working harder. Your mouth is getting dried out. Uh, and your heart's working harder. Um, and so you do that for all your life. As we get older, it begins to affect um, our, our health and overall. So if we can learn to breathe a more controlled breathing and take reduce our volume, but increase our quali quality of breath, um, and most importantly, breathe through our nose and not our mouth, uh, that will affect our overall health in a, in a beneficial manner. So number one, we need to breathe less, okay, less volume. We need to understand the importance of CO2 in our breathing, uh, which will describe a, a lot about CO2. And when we breathe, Mary's gonna do a little uh, exercise for us on yoga breathing. And I'm sure a lot of you, I'm preaching to the choir here, a lot of you I'm sure uh, know how to do yoga breathing, breathing from your abdomen, let your diaphragm hold down and fill up your lungs and then let it roll up into your lungs and then just slowly breathe out through your nose. And, and one thing that I found in some of the readings, I'm gonna share a couple of readings with you today. And I will again, put this on Dropbox. Uh, I'll put the lecture uh, and it has the pictures of the books that I recommend. It has the picture of the exercises that I I'm gonna recommend. So um, I'll send that out to everybody and again, if you don't can't pick it up, let me know and I'll, I'll make sure you get that. But uh, the slides and the presentations will all be on there. And I think um, um, Rosie's recording this today. So I'm sure that could be available as well. So CO2 is really important. We think of oxygen as being important, but it's the CO2 that allows the, the hemoglobin, hemoglobin in our blood carries the oxygen. And the CO2 comes in and replaces that, and that helps the action to, to release, to get into the uh, muscles um, and, and allows our cells to utilize the action. Without the CO2, we don't get that. And a minute ago, I, I talked about breathing with your upper chest and breathing very anxious and shallow breathing. Or if you, if you uh, yawn or you sigh a lot, Okay. What you're doing is you're blowing out the CO2 and you're making your body harder to obtain the oxygen that they need. So to, in order to increase the oxygen in the cells, we need to do a nice, slow, deep breath, fill up the lungs, hold it a little bit, let that CO2 get into the bloodstream and then slowly blow it on out. And so and CO2 plays a, a lot of different things we'll, we'll talk about as well in some other exercises as far as dilating our, our na nasal passages and helping us to open up our, our nose so we can breathe through our nose much better. And then lastly, I want to, you to be able to recognize the signs and symptoms of sleep disorder breathing and how it affects us. Uh, if we don't breathe properly at nighttime, we don't get into the delta stage of sleep uh, that can affect weight gain. It can affect uh, how we grow as a child. Uh, and it can affect our facial growth and development, which will also, if we have, a, if our upper jaw doesn't grow well and our lower jaw doesn't grow well, and we have reduced breathing through our nose and we're forced to breathe through our mouth, that sets up a ca whole cascade of things that are going to uh, have a, a negative impact on our overall health, health as we get older. So 
So the three things, breathe less, number one, uh, the importance of CO2, and we'll talk about signs and symptoms. I'm gonna show you signs and symptoms uh, through some of my patients uh, so you understand what those signs are and why those signs appear. Uh, and a lot has to do with the CO2 and the breathing properly. Okay, so to begin, um, I'm going to invite my wife, Mary, to join us. And I'm sure she's excited to say hello to everybody. And uh, uh, she can lead us in just, we only have a few minutes to do this. So we're going to do a quick um, yoga breathing just to sort of get everybody refreshed. You can listen to uh, uh, Edward. And Edward, I'm sorry I missed your presentation. I had to be at church this morning to run the video. Um, I got, saw a little bit of Zoe's. That was very interesting and, and uh, uh, very important for uh, uh, the, the Duncan uh, dress and, and costumes. And uh, so without further ado, I present my wife, Mary de Santa Rose. <laughs> Zoe had her mother, I got my wife. <laughs> Good morning. Hi, everyone. So good to see faces and names at least out there. Beautiful. I'm not quite as tall as my husband, so we're going to switch. There we go. Very good. All right. So to begin, similar to what we did in our yoga class together when we were in Delphi, and it just such beautiful memories. So we're going to bring those back, too. So let's just take a moment to sit up in our chairs to close our eyes, to really go inside and to take that breath in through our nose, filling up from the base of our spine, all the way up through our belly, into our middle ribs and up to our upper chest. And then exhaling slowly through our nose from our upper chest, down through our ribs, softening them, softening all the way down the spine. You may even feel your spine soften in your chair. And taking that breath in again. And slow exhale out. And breathing in again. And slow exhale out. And the real benefit is allowing ourselves to do this through our nose. So kind of impossible for me as I'm talking, but for all of you to take advantage of that breath, breathing in through our nose and out through our nose allowing the oxygen to fill every cell of our body. And taking it at your own pace, feeling that beautiful breath coming in and flowing out. And the nose is able to filter all of the things we don't want to take into our bodies. So it's so much better to breathe through our nose in that way. And then slowly open your eyes and let the light back in. and know that that breath has really refreshed us. And I'm gonna share with you something that Gary has helped me with when I'm sleeping. It's my mouth uh, open and I'm breathing through my mouth there. And we have little tape I can put it over or we have a strap that I can put under my chin and it hooks up here and I'll go get it um, that's upstairs that will keep my jaw just like that. And so then it can't open all the way. So it really encourages me to breathe through my nose. And I find that I don't wake up with a dry mouth. I seem to sleep better and it really has been helpful. 
If you make a true toy and you're like this, you feel like you're in a straight jacket. It's not fun. <laughs> so you can keep it loose, but just enough to keep your jaw soft there. Good. So I'll let him take over for a minute. Oh, well, well, I have Mary here. Um, we're going to be talking about how to do a coddle test on yourself. And basically what a coddle test is, is you breathe through your nose and then you take two fingers and just sort of pull your nostrils away from each other like this. And when you do that, see if it's, you're able to get more air through your nose. In Mary's case, her left nostril, or we call that a nasal valve, is much more narrow than the right nostril. And the other test you can do, you can take a little mirror, like a little hand mirror, and place it underneath your nose and breathe into the mirror. And if one of the fog areas is much smaller than the other fog area, then you'll know that that nasal valve is, is smaller and is not opening as much. So I'll show you some of the things that you can use to put into the nose to open up those valves at nighttime. Or um, if you find you benefit from the coddle test, there's breathe right strips and there's silicone plugs and there's these things called mute, what I have on, on the PowerPoint, you'll see them later on. Uh, but those are very useful at nighttime. And a lot of us just might need that little addendum or a little opening here to allow more air to flow through the nose. And that may be enough to help you to um, continue breathing through your nose and not have to breathe through your mouth at night time. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. So the other thing I want to do, I want to give you a little uh, test. Uh, in this book, it's called Close Your Mouth, okay, by Patrick McKeon. And again, this is on the, on the uh, slides. So I have all the information on the slides for you. And he wrote this book, particularly for asthma, uh, patients that suffer from asthma. And there's a lot of exercises in here. But the first thing is you have to know what your, your base level um, breathing volume is. And the way he does that, or way he recommends doing that, is first thing in the morning when you get up, just sit on the edge of the bed and just take a couple of nice, slow, deep breaths and sort of wake up a little bit. And then just blow a little air out and then you're gonna hold your nose. And it's not a test of how long you can hold your nose. It's the test of how long you can just hold your nose without feeling like you've got to get an extra breath. So once your stomach starts getting a little tight and you feel you got to get breath, then, then breathe again. And you should be able to get back to your normal breath within one or two breaths if you're doing it correctly. If you're holding your nose too long, you have to gasp. You don't want to do that. Um, and so we can practice that right now. And I'll, I'll just uh, put a little timer on here. Let's see. And I'll just, I'll just call out like 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. And whenever you, you, you feel that need for breath, then just stop and take your breath. But that time that you, you stop, that's what you, your controlled pause is. Okay, and then we'll talk about that in a minute. So, so here we go. So take a nice, slow, deep breath in. Let some out. And ready? Start. Hold your nose. Five, ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty five, thirty. 35, 40, okay. All right, everybody get to get your breath, okay. Um, now, if you have a control pause of 10 seconds or less, then you probably may have some chronic asthma problems. Uh, you may have some chronic lung problems. Um, and you, normally you wanna to try to shoot for a control pause of 40. And most people might be able to get 20 to 30. And there's exercises in this book, and I'll give you some exercises at the, the end you can do to try to increase that control pause. Because the higher your control pause is, the less air volume you need. 
So if, if I can hold my control pause as a 40 and say Mary's has a 20 and she needs to breathe twice as much that I need to breathe, um, and her volume is going to be much greater because she needs more air to sustain uh, her oxygen needs than I need. So swimming is a really good exercise to increase your control pause. And again, there's exercises that you can do to increase your control pause. And, uh, and, and, and a lot of it is just as you inhale and you exhale, I usually tell my patients just how to relax them is to inhale for maybe the ideal breathing time, which is interesting in uh, this other book that uh, I recommend. This is called Breathe, and the author is James Nestor. Uh, and he wrote that the through studies of, um, of Buddhist monks and uh, doing their mantras, and uh, he also found that um, in Catholics doing the rosary, the decans of the, the cadences to do that is about five and a half seconds. So like, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. That's about five seconds. So if you're doing that in your head and breathing through that cadence, then you're getting about five and a half second of breath in, five and a half out. So you're breathing only six or seven times a minute. So you're really slowing down your, your, um, your need to take a lot of air in. And uh, um, so that might be helpful for um, some of you when you're trying to um, get to that um, slower breathing. Okay. So that's your controlled pause. And then you can test that. You can test that on a regular basis. You can test it every day. Um, when you're walking, uh, and a good exercise to do when you're walking is not to walk and chat with somebody all the time because then you're exhaling all your CO2. Uh, humming is very good if you pick up a nice sauna and hum it while you're walking. And you can count your steps and hold your breath and you know, breathe normal and then hold your breath and count how many steps. So say I get 10 steps before I need my breath again. So I, I get back and I catch my breath again for another 30 seconds. And then the next time I try to go 12 steps. Um, and then over the months, you might be able to get 20, 30 steps or 40 steps. And, and as you're doing that, you're increasing your control pause and decreasing the amount of air volume that you need uh, to sustain uh, your breathing pattern. Okay, one last thing is that we all wake up when we have a stuffy nose sometimes. And if we have a cold, it's difficult to breathe through your nose because it's all uh, congested. So there's a technique called the nasal clearing. Um, now, if you have high blood pressure, if you're pregnant, uh, if you have uh, congestive uh, lung problems, uh, this is probably not a good thing for you to do. But if other than that, your, your health is pretty good and you're just having a cold, uh, what you can do, now this case, you're gonna take a deep breath or a breath in, blow it out and you're gonna hold your nose and you're gonna to try to hold it as long as you can. This is different than the control pause, okay? Uh, and as you hold it as long as you can, what's happening, you're building up CO2 and nitric acid in your nose. And as that nitric acid and, and CO2 builds up in your nose and sinuses, it dilates the vessels, the blood vessels that are in there. And once the blood vessels are dilated, that helps to get rid of the congestion and helps you to breathe again. And many times it may take, be two or three times so you do it and then take about 30 seconds to catch your breath and get back to a normal breath again and then try it again if you rock your head you know, side to side as you're holding it too it helps to force the air up into the different sinus passages so you get the co2 and the nitric acid up in your sinuses to, to help clear that so that's a little trick you can use to uh, uh, you know help clear your nose if you uh wake up in the morning and have difficulty there. So um, in both of those books, there are a lot of different breathing techniques. There's a lot of yoga breathing techniques where it's, you, you hold one nostril and breathe in and out and then and alternate nostrils. Uh, all are very good as far as the developing your breathing. Okay. All right. Any questions on any of that before we go to the uh, slide presentation? Okay. There we go. All right, <clears throat> this was Delphi in 2017 and Temple in 2017. Uh, these were uh, oh, Skidmore students that came with Mary 
in, uh, for the week when we were in Delphi then. And so I became Skidmore dad to, to the Cerebral Project Center, about eight students here. Uh, this was this Edward, Edward, uh, Jake, and Peter. And uh, interesting story, we did a, a men's workshop and we put on a, uh, a, we had to choreograph a piece that had to do with the, the Olympics. And so I was a discus thrower and we came back and after lunch and Jean says, I want to see what the men did. And so we performed and she goes, oh, I love that. You have to perform at the concert tomorrow night. And I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> so this was my debut of dancing and thank goodness Jake was in front of me. And uh, 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 as you know, I'm not a, uh, not a dancer. So this was a little bit out of my comfort zone, but uh, you kept so breathing. <laughs> I kept breathing. Yes. And sometimes you have to go out of your comfort zone to uh, enjoy life a little bit more. The hardest thing was trying to figure out how to put the tunic on. I didn't have Zoe there to help me. That would have been helpful too. But <laughs> anyway, um, Mary and I live up in upstate New York for all those who are out of the country. Um, we live in the Adirondack Park in New York State in a little place on the uh, Sacandaga Lake. And this is our lake here, our dog. And I do enjoy playing some music at church and my percussionist. And these are our children, Matt and Maria. This was the vacation in Alaska, I think. And I'm an avid cyclist and um, our cousins have had MS. So we, we ride to uh, make, raise money for uh, MS farm. And this is where we live right here on this beautiful little peninsula and it's a gorgeous spot and you're all welcome to come and visit anytime we have an extra little apartment downstairs this is sailing on the second dog that's not me sailing it's someone else's sailboat <laughs> some people like to sail in the winter time but uh, <laughs> we can have a problem with that and this is what we do in the winter time for those of you in the uh, southern climates that don't experience snow so, <laughs> so anyway um, in dental school i got this little pin from one of the uh, uh, dental health education courses. And this is, I, I attach this to my wall in the office because it's probably the only thing I, uh, this is the most important thing I took from four years of dental school to attach to every tooth, there's a person. And the more we learn about uh, how we are also intricately connected from top to bottom and how everything affects everything else, uh, the more, astounding I'm becoming on how amazing the human body is and what a miracle that we all are and that we uh, uh, can function like we do. Uh, thanks to Vince, I got this little picture from Apollo. Uh, and in Apollo, in one of the lectures, I think, uh, well, I think it was Chris Quartz was saying uh, that uh, we, he was for harmony, harmony in the cosmic range, harmony, political and peace, and harmony in our health and well-being. And in breathing really comes in our harmony to keep our health in good shape. And a lot of times what we don't see, we don't understand. So uh, by doing lectures like this and sharing this information with you to show you some other things that you may not have seen and my, me taking lectures from other people and uh, uh, obtaining knowledge we learn to look at things differently and learn to see things that we may not have um, uh, known before. Let's see, do I have to admit Jean here? Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, get the screen up here. Okay. So we, first of all, we're gonna talk about airway and um, sleep disorder breathing. And then we're gonna be a detective so you can determine if a family member or so you can determine what signs and symptoms uh, you may be looking for to determine whether you might have a uh, sleep disorder breathing problem and then what we can do to prevent it. Let's see if I hide this again. Okay. Now we all start life like this. beautiful sound of our first breath. But somehow, some of us end up, as we're growing a little bit older, end up breathing like this. Okay, this is a picture of Eli holding his breath. Right now he's snoring. We're going to see what happens. 
Notice he has his mouth open. 6, 2009. There you go. You got it. He shakes. He's some. And that's okay. I, I won't go through this whole thing here, but Eli has All sleep apnea. He's taking right now. He's not really getting much into his lungs. There you go. And he will actually stop breathing and gasping for air. Um, Obviously, he has a congested nasal airway. He's mouth breathing. Um, and when people snore, snoring, think of snoring as a blocked airway. Snoring is not natural. If you're snoring, then your tongue is usually dropping back and blocking your airway. Your adenoids and tonsils may be swollen. Um, so if, if there's signs and symptoms of snoring and if the kids come in, I'm watching the kids to see if they're breathing through the mouth or their mouth breathers. Then I have a clue that there's something going on uh, it's, it's causing the breathing difficulty. Uh, kids shouldn't look like this. They shouldn't have dark rings underneath their eyes. And we'll see a little bit later, see how you can see the white sclera here. These are beginning signs and symptoms of an airway disorder here. And so as we get older, you know, a lot of times we end up having to have health breathing. And the CPAP is a continuous positive air pressure. And CPAP is actually very helpful. Um, people that uh, are starting to get uh, gastric reflux, they're putting on weight, they're beginning to get, uh, their sugar levels are going up. All of that can be due for, from sleep disorder breathing and sleep apnea. And by going to CPAP, now they can get a good night's sleep and they can begin to reverse some of these things, okay? But ideally, we would like to not get to this point and catch it early on, on, early on when you know, we're young children or uh, before larger problems uh, start. So what does dentistry have to do with all this? Well, what I see, I've had patients with parents coming in and they said, all right, well, what should we do about this where the lower teeth are jutting out from the upper teeth or this where the, there's like a little gap here and the tongue is sticking through the space. We're here where the one tooth is behind and these upper teeth are behind these lower teeth. We're here where the upper teeth are pregnant, you know, sticking out and there's this big gap there. And all of this has to do with how the child is breathing. And we'll describe that a little bit later here. So here's an x-ray. We call this a cephalometric x-ray, the side of the x-ray, the side of the head. And this dark line going down here is the airway. This is a nice wide airway. We've got you know, 10 to 15 millimeters here. And this is where the adenoids are up in here. You can't see the adenoids. If you can take a mirror and stick it away in the back of your throat and look up, then you can see them. Uh, but the ENT doctor can uh, actually look, scope through the nose and see them as well. The tonsils are down in this area and we can see tonsils, or at least the top part of the tonsil, which we'll look at in a little bit. But we don't like to see this where this airway is very, very narrow here in the tonsil area here, this child is going to suffer from the breathing problem. He's not gonna be able to breathe through his nose. They're gonna open their mouths to try to open this airway up. And when that begins to happen, a lot of different things happen, which we'll talk about in a minute here. When we have a normal growth and development, we have a very well-defined lower jaw and a nice, fairly straight, slightly convex profile. When we're breathing through our mouth, the angle here gets longer, the lower jaw is undefined, and we have a little steeper angle of the jaw here. And so we sort of lose that jaw profile. Um, and if we don't breathe through our nose, the upper jaw gets underdeveloped. And so we're flat here rather than have a nice full face here. So breathing affects how we develop and how our face develops when we're growing. So we want to be able to start off breathing well and continue that breathing, good breathing throughout our developmental lives and throughout our years ahead. Um, this is a little thing that shows us the effects of the tongue on our breathing. Swallow around 600 times per day with about two pounds of force against the palate. This frequent force exerted on the palate as well as your resting tongue posture can affect the dental arch. Quite simply put, if the tongue isn't exerting force on the roof of the mouth and pushing the teeth outwards, they can come to cave in. The upper arch should form like this, thanks to the tongue pressing against the teeth, preventing the pressure of the cheeks from pushing them in. But if the tongue isn't holding the teeth in place, 
the teeth can get crowded inwards. Okay, so the tongue is very important as far as our swallowing pressure, 600 times a day, we're pushing out there. But if our mouth is open, the tongue is not going where it's supposed to go, all right? It doesn't push up in here, and the cheeks push against the sides of the mouth, and that causes the, the upper jaw and the teeth to collapse in like this, which causes all this crowding here. So again, breathing through our nose, getting the tongue to swallow in the proper position is very important in the establishing of good growth and development. Okay, this is the book that I mentioned, Breathe, by James Nestor. And what James Nestor did, in the, in this, as the story goes through, he and a colleague actually uh, did an experiment on themselves, and they, they basically plugged their nose, and they forced themselves to breathe through the mouth for two weeks. And they did all sorts of tests. They did blood tests and breathing tests, exercise tests uh, before they did this, and they continued to monitor it through the two-week period. And... There was, the, there was definitely a decline in their, uh, their health and their ability to do as uh, their physical exercises uh, were diminished uh, just from that two week period of mouth breathing. So it's, it's very interesting and a, a very good book to, uh, to, to read through uh, if you're interested in the subject. And, and back in the 880, the Chinese knew that the nose is a heavenly door and the breast must be taken through it. Never do otherwise for breath would be in danger and illness would set in. So they were wise on this back, back then. Uh, one of the little stories that uh, Nestor tells in his book is about this fellow, George Catlin, who was a, a lawyer, he was a painter, and he was a mouth breather. He had uh, some asthma, he had breathing difficulties. And early in his, I think in his 20s, he decided that he was going to move out into the western part of the country, get out of the city, and hopefully he could breathe better. So he took his paintbrushes and he decided he was going to uh, go visit the indigenous tribes in the United States. And he ended up going through all around the world with uh, visiting different tribes. And he would paint, uh, uh, he would paint uh, the scenes and, the, and uh, paint the uh, tribal members as well. And one of the things that he, he learned from the Native Americans is that uh, the air inhaled through the nose, or excuse me, air inhaled through the mouth, sapped the body of strength and deformed the face, causing stress and disease. Air inhaled through the nose, kept the body strong, made the face beautiful, and prevented disease. And when the mothers were carrying the infants around in their little papoose, if the infant began to open the mouth, the mother would just gently close the mouth and force the infant to breathe through its nose. Um, so he learned a lot about nose breathing while he was out there and uh, became a nose breather. Um, his asthma reduced, he became healthier and he lived to be 76. So, so the Native Americans also knew the importance of that. And if you go back in the Bible, we equal time for Genesis, the Lord God for man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life man became a living soul. So even God breathed into the nostrils. <laughs> he knew how important the nostrils were. So let's look at the nose. What does this nose do? Um, it has a lot of important functions. It filters and warms the air that comes into it. It also moisturizes our air. If you looked at a dissection, if you look at the nose, it has nasal turbinates. And turbinates are like a conch shell. They, they, they force the air to go into little circular paths. And what that does, it regulates the volume of air that we can actually take in. So it reduces the amount of air that we can take in. It regulates how much we can take in. It moisturizes it and it cleans it. It cleans uh, some astounding amount of billions of bacteria. Every time we breathe, the nose is, is filtering that. And in reading this book, I found a very interesting <laughs> point about what the nose does. It also is important as far as regulating blood pressure and sugar levels as well as too, I've learned. But it has a very interesting, uh, it does heart rate, blood, uh, blood pressure digestion. And it also has, which was very interesting, it has erection tissue in the nose, <laughs> uh, which I never even knew. But, uh, and, and this tissue actually, the nose 
Uh, if you notice, sometimes you can read your right nose, right nostril, and sometimes the left nostrils, and they cycle. And everybody's cycle is a little bit different. And, and as the tissue um, in one nostril may, the, the tissue may um, enlarge a little bit and causing a little bit of blockage, and then it will cycle back. Um, and it's the same sort of uh, tissue that's uh, um, uh, uh, <laughs> that has to do with our, our sexual drives. And one of the, the humorous stories is that they actually have something called honeymoon rhinitis, in which um, as couples are aroused, some, some reactions may be uh, stuffiness, runny nose, or coughing. So <laughs> I thought that was amusing, but... Uh, how important the nose is. So uh, just re go, go take out of this how important the nose and how much we need to breathe through the nose and not close our mouth. Uh, one of the pediatric dentists that spoke with us uh, gave us the, the effect of nasal obstruction. So if our nose is obstructed and we can't breathe through our nose, uh, what happens? Well, we breathe in less oxygen. So our oxygen levels are actually less, okay? So our brain gets less oxygen. Uh, our immune system is, is, is impaired. So we're more prone to getting sick and cold. Uh, it causes abnormal tongue position, which we showed in that video. So now we're not pressing against the, the roof of our mouth to developing in our upper jaw and palate. It can also affect our posture and our growth. And it can cause severe, some severe medical problems in adulthood, which I mentioned, and, and uh, eventually needing a CPAP. <clears throat> so let's look a little bit at our airway and why it's important. So the airway is broken down into three areas. We have a nasal uh, pharynx, which comes through the nose down to the, to the lungs. We have our oral pharynx, where we can breathe through our mouth, and we have our laryngeal pharynx further down. So this is our, our path down to our lungs. So when we eat food, this little epiglottis closes over the airway or the, the top of the opening, like a little lid here, so we don't get food down into our lungs, and then the food will go down to here. When we're breathing, this is open, and so the air comes down to here. Now at nighttime, if we sleep, and we're breathing through our mouth and our tongue drops back and begins to close this airway off, <clears throat> it changes the force that goes, takes the air down through our lungs. If that airway is closed by half, it causes, we have to work 16 times harder. That takes a 16 times harder force to get the air through our trachea to get it down to our lungs. And with that increase of the force going down to our lungs, that creates a negative pressure from our stomach up to this little tube here, the esophagus. So acid uh, from our stomach comes up and that's what acid indi indigestion is, or gastric reflux is. Um, and that's one of the causes of gastric reflux is that we're snoring and our airway is being blocked and the acid from our stomach is coming up and causing acid reflux, okay? So again, if you know, if you're snoring or know if someone's snoring, and they have acid reflux, it's probably a sleeping problem and not a stomach problem. I mentioned this book that Patrick McCown uh, has written, and he's very well known. And if you look on YouTube and go to Buteco Breathing, um, he goes through the exercises of uh, breathing, and particularly his emphasis on asthmatic patients, and he's helped you know, numbers of thousands of asthmatic patients who are suffering from asthma to be able to live a normal life again, just through breathing and doing these exercises and then being aware of how they need to breathe properly. We talked a little bit about our controlled pause, and that's a test to see what our volume is. So the higher our controlled pause, if we're up in the 42nd range, then that means we need less air volume to breathe, and that's good. So we want to try to increase our controlled pause, particularly if it's down in in the 20 or less than 20 second zone, uh, but try to get it up to about 40 second would be a healthy range for us. And, and a lot of us need to do the exercises um, to try to do that. So um, pick up this little book from, and, uh, and that will show you how you can be able to do that. We talked about overbreathing. We don't want to overbreathe. So again, 
how the transfer works is this is like a subway station, okay? We normally, if you put a little um, odometer on your finger or oxygen meter on your finger, we normally at least 95, most of us probably 98% saturated. So we have a lot of oxygen in our blood, but the problem is we've got to get the oxygen out of our blood to get it over into the tissue. And that's where CO2 comes in. So the more the CO2 is in our air, then the oxygen can move over and get into the tissue where it's needed, required. That's why rapid upper chest breathing is not good. Sign is not good. Deep yawns are not good. Yelling a lot for a long time is not good because you're losing your CO2 and you're blowing out all that CO2. You want to try to maintain that CO2 and take pauses in between your inhales and exhales. Okay, so how does sleep disorder breathing relate to dentistry? Well, first of all, what is sleep disorder breathing? It's basically having difficulty breathing while you're sleeping. Um, it can result in a loud snoring, um, which is, in, or it can result in actually stopping breathing, which is obstructive sleep apnea. You saw with Eli, that little boy, how eventually they actually stopped breathing for a little bit. But as you can imagine, that affects your sleep cycle pretty drastically. So sleep disorder breathing in children can cause a lot of problems. Um, ADHD, AD, bedwetting. Bedwetting has been found to be about 30% in patients and young children that have sleep disorder breathing or have sleep apnea. I had two patients that they had the dark rings underneath their eyes. Um, they were coming with mouth breathing. They had a forward head posture, which I'll show you later. And so I began asking questions to the parents. I took the parents inside and asked them about, does a child have any problem with bedwetting? And this child was 12 years old. They said, yes. And you know, she'd never been able to go to uh, her friend's uh, overnight parties. <clears throat> and they've been to the doctors and they're trying to give her medication on it. And the bedwetting was due because she had enlarged tonsils and noids and she couldn't breathe through her nose. And once she saw the ENT and they removed the tonsils and adenoids, uh, the bedwetting stopped. Um, you know, so she went 12 years without it being diagnosed, which is, could have been treated possibly with, uh, uh, without having tonsils and adenoids out earlier if they were able to uh, keep the swelling down. Now, the trouble is when we breathe through our mouth, the air is not filtered like it's breathed to your nose. And so now you've got all this bacteria coming into your mouth, going into the tonsil area. So now the tonsils become inflamed um, and they swell up and that just adds to the cycle. And I, I liken it to a snowball rolling down the hill. Uh, it just continues to cause more and more problems as we get older and as, as we continue to mouth breathe um, and develop snoring, uh, restless sleep, uh, delayed or stunted growth. Kids can have a lot of nightmares. A lot of times they have a lower IQ because we have less oxygen going to the brain. Chronic allergies, crooked teeth, which we showed how not having the tongue in the proper spot. We talked about dark circles, aggressive behavior, daytime drowsiness. The kids can't study because they're tired because they're not sleeping during the nighttime. So nine out of ten kids suffer from one or more of these symptoms, right? Some kids have a lot of the symptoms depending on the degree of their uh, uh, sleep disorder breathing problem. Adults also suffer. Men tend to suffer twice as much as women. Uh, a lot of men and women have moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea. Okay, uh, as we, if you imagine if you're waking up and restless during the night and you're not getting into what we call a delta stage of sleep, and the delta stage of sleep is when we produce uh, hormones, the brain produces hormones, leptin and ghrelin, and one of them tells us that we've had enough to eat, and the other one tells us that we're still hungry. So, of course, when we don't get enough sleep and we're not getting into the stages, the one that tells us that we're still hungry gets elevated. So we tend to eat more. When we tend to eat more of the wrong things, we're eating carbohydrates and sweets, and we're gaining weight and we're becoming obese. As we become obese, then we have trouble with our sugar, monitoring our sugar levels. Then we get adult onset diabetes. Uh, we talked about gastric reflux because of the 
in a way called the Venturi effect, the force of the air down causing the negative pressure coming on up. Our blood pressure gets elevated because now we're putting a lot of pressure on our heart, trying to breathe harder. Um, increased rate of stroke, heart failure, coronary disease, mental illness, uh, grinding our teeth, grinding and bruxism. Uh, grinding our teeth is, has a, a high degree, I think it's about 35% of people that have sleep disorder breathing will grind their teeth. And they believe it has to do with once you stop breathing in your sleep, the clenching or grinding the teeth is a mechanism of trying to open up that airway again. So we see a lot of people with grinding their teeth and you put together some of these other parts of the puzzle and it all focuses back. They're not sleeping, but they have either obstructive sleep apnea or what they would do at this point is I would send them out to get a sleep study done uh, to confirm whether they have a, uh, a low, moderate or high level of uh, obstructive sleep apnea. And, uh, Simon's problems, crowding, critical teeth, they're tired during the day, uh, they fall asleep at the wheel, cause an accident. So, so how do we identify them? Again, their health history is very important. We're going to look at the faces and show you some of the things with the faces. We already talked about some of them. So we talked about, this is where the adenoids would be, and this is where the tonsils are. This is the normal airway. But what happens when we start mouth breathing? So when we start mouth breathing, the mouth is open, and so the tongue is lower, so we're not getting the outward pressure on the upper teeth. The, the cheeks are causing inward pressure, so we're getting a crowding here. In the back teeth now, because the teeth are apart, because the mouth is open, the back teeth can erupt more. So as the back teeth erupts more, that causes this wedge to open up even more. And so we get a developmental problem with the jaws opening up and what we call like an anterior open bite. And as the jaw opens up and goes back, it begins to constrict the airway and causes more, uh, a smaller airway, which causes more difficulty breathing, causing snoring, and, we, and there's a change in head posture, which we discussed. So when we look at tonsils, you can look at your own tonsils, just basically look in the mirror, and they're graded on the one to four basis. If the tonsils are halfway between this little thing called the uvula, which hangs down, it's a grade two. If they're three quarters of the way from the side of the, the uh, pharynx to the uvula, they're three. And if they're touching the uvula, there are four. So if you're in the three or four range, or if your child or grandchild is three or four range and they're mouth breathing, maybe they're not snoring yet, but they may start snoring, um, these tonsils need to be evaluated by ear, nose, and throat person. The other little rule that we go by, we call melampotty index, and that's basically when you open your mouth, if we can see the whole uvula, that's good. That means you've got a pretty good airway. Some people's soft palate tends to drop down a little bit further in the back. So now you can only see half of it here. So this would be uh, a class three. If you can't see the uvula at all, it's a class four. So if you've got a class four like this one where you can't see the uvula, the tongue is high, this person is, has a potential of having a breathing issue. Okay, uh, because their airway is going to be a little bit smaller than someone's that you can see the whole uvula on the back of the throat because of the soft palate position. Now, if we can't breathe through our nose and we have to breathe through our mouth, it's a lot easier to breathe through your mouth if you bring your head forward and your jaw drops down a little bit. So these kids and adults develop what we call a forward head posture. Rather than head being straight up over the shoulders, it comes forward now. And as an adult, you can imagine doing this for all your life. For every 10 degrees you move your head forward, you're putting another um, 10 pounds of pressure on your neck muscles and your back muscles. So normally the head weighs about 10 to 12 pounds. So now if you go out uh, another 30 degrees, now you got another, it's 10 pounds for every 10 degrees. So now you got 42 pounds of pressure. And if you're way out there, you're getting a lot of pressure. So this is, can affect the, the musculature, your back, in uh, a lot of back aches, neck aches. Um, your whole body alignment begins to get altered. And I, I like this little uh, diagram here. I don't know if you can read it. Well, I've got discomfort in my feet, and now my knees are stiff, and my ache in my back is bothering me. The crick in, in my neck bothers me, and I get a headache. 
and it, it can all be related from the jaw position, how you're breathing. It can be related to, you could have one leg a little bit longer than the other. Um, so we're all related from head to toe of everything that we do. Um, we make what we call little splints or orthotics for people to try to get their jaws in the right alignment. And in so doing, we can see postural changes taking place uh, just by getting the jaws properly aligned. So it's really amazing how there's, there's this entire interconnection with the entire body, which when you think about it, it's, it's really, obviously it's the way it should be, but uh, in medicine, we get so focused on specialties and uh, we forget that uh, the person has the entire body. <laughs> we have to look, look in the whole thing. So this forehead posture, they found that uh, uh, by correcting at an earlier age, by having your tonsils and aneroids removed, it can normalize as early as one month. So again, early treatment is really important. I like this quote because first we form habits and then they form us. So we have to conquer our bad habits or they will eventually conquer us. And that is so true. So we have to get these habits corrected early on so they don't conquer us. Okay, so here's a young gal, probably about 12, 13 years old. Um, and she has this long face. She's a mouse breather. Um, she has a, a, a constrictor. Sometimes we call this a V-shaped upper arch, okay? So the tongue's not where it's supposed to be. And she's got venous pooling under her eyes. Um, she's got, you can see the sclera. And you see the sclera because the maxilla is not formed, it's underdeveloped. So the maxilla holds the eyes or the orbits. And so as the maxilla grows downward forward, it supports the eyes. So if the maxilla doesn't grow, then you don't have that support of the eyes. So you end up seeing more of the, the, the orbit um, above the eyelid here. And again, the upper jaws is constricted. So that causes what we call cross bites where the upper teeth are inside or they're not outside the lower teeth that they should be. So here's this. So this is another little sign you can look at for your grandchildren or uh, your, your children. Um, if you see that they've got you know, dark underneath their, their eyes and you can see their sclera, then they may have probably have a breathing problem. If you look at here carefully, you see their left nasal um, valve is much smaller than the right one. So she could really early on, should have been seen by ear, nose, and throat person and, and uh, had that evaluated and uh, could have been corrected possibly. Oh, okay. Um, why do we get the uh, venous pulling underneath the eyes? I'm going to do this really quickly here. All right, this is our upper jaw, and there's a little opening here called the terrible maxillary fissure. And we have a vein underneath our eye. This is where the eye is here. And there's a little hole right here where the nerves and the blood vessels come out. And normally that vein is a pretty good vein and that vein drains into here. Now, if our upper jaw doesn't get developed, we're not breathing through our nose. We breathe through our nose, the jaw gets developed uh, normally. It goes down and forward. If that doesn't happen, then this little fissure doesn't get big enough. And so now the, the blood is trying to drain through a narrower, more narrow opening. And so it backs up. It, it doesn't have a place to drain properly, so it backs up underneath the eye, causing the darkness underneath the eye. The other reason why we get darkness underneath the eye is if you remember, when we mouth breathe, we blow out the CO2 and the nitric acid. So if we're blowing that out, that causes the blood vessels to dilate, which is a good thing, but we don't have that now in the nose because we're not breathing through our nose. So we don't have that dilation effect. So the, so the veins stay constricted and the blood, again, doesn't flow properly the way it should. We talked about grinding of our teeth uh, can be related to bruxism. There's like a 33% uh, correlation with bruxism and uh, sleep, obstructive sleep apnea. That's where you actually stop breathing at night time. Okay, so when you have a sleep study done, they come back with what they call an apnea hypoxia index. And it tells you uh, apneas are actually when you stop breathing, hypopneas is when you have shallow breathing. They, they have a little monitor and they can see, they, they put all these little um, monitors on you. Uh, they have home tests now too that are very good. I've got a, I wrote down one of the home tests here that you can look into. 
one of them. Uh, after you're done, it will tell you how many of these events you have in an hour. So if you have less than five, you're probably normal. If you've got uh, five, but less than 15, it's a mild case. If you've got a more than 15, but greater than 30, it's a moderate case. If you got over 30 episodes per hour, then you've got a severe case. Okay, that little boy, Eli, he had a severe case. And I've had, uh, I've had truck drivers that I wanted them to get a sleep study done. And the sad thing is they wouldn't get it done because if they recorded that they had moderate to severe sleep apnea, they could lose their license. And so that bothers me because you're on the road and, and the trucks go by and just wonder whether that truck driver has sleep apnea or not. So it's scary. Uh, okay, we talked about cross bites a little bit. I'm not gonna get into that for you guys. But if you can imagine if your jaws aren't growing properly and you have to shift your jaw in this, oops, excuse me, in this case, we're lining up to midlines. I don't know if you can see the lower jaw shifted to the right here. Okay, so here's the middle, lower jaw, here's the middle level. So if they're shifted to the right, that puts the jawbone further back. And we call that the temporal mandibular joint or the TMJ joint right in front of your ear. And so as, as that jawbone is being pushed back against in that joint area, that can cause pains in the joint. So people can have TMJ pains, they can get headaches. Uh, if their jaws are malaligned. Um, and that all stems from mouth breathing and not getting a proper development of their jaws. Okay, so let's see if I can, I'm gonna be going over time here. I hope, hope we're okay if I go another 10 minutes or rosy. Uh, so the clues are long face. We talked about venous pulling, the sclera underneath the eyes. The lips don't come together. A lot of times they have small noses. They have a mid-face discrepancy and a forward head posture. Inside, they have narrow jaws. They have cross bites. Uh, tonsils can be large, high melon potty index, uh, gastric reflux, and snoring. Most of the time, you, you're going to notice mouth breathing and snoring, and all these other ones are going to follow suit. So what causes this? We, we talked about a lot of the causes. Uh, mouth breathing causes the tonsils and adenoids to uh, inflame. Uh, if we have a compromised airway, they can't breathe through the nose. We get underdeveloped upper jaws, underdeveloped lower jaws, a weak tongue. All contributes to this whole cycle of not being able to breathe properly. Why is it important to start early? Because our upper jaw is pretty much developed halfway by two years old. And by the time we're four or five, we've got 75% of them developed. And before we're 12 years old, we, we got about 90% of our jaw developed. So if we wait till we're 15 years old to do anything, most of that jaw is already developed. So that's why early treatment is so important. So normally we go downward and forward and wide, but a lot of us aren't doing that. So there are a couple of studies, a couple of people, um, Weston Price, uh, he traveled around the, to study indigenous cultures and he studied their diet, their vitamin, their fiber content, and he studied the effect of the jaws in dental decay. Most of them did not have very much decay. They had very good development of their jaws. And another person named uh, Robert Corcini out of the University of Illinois did something similar. He's an anthropologist. And he did 30 years of research studying indigenous groups all around. And he found that 400 years ago, this is what the jaw looked like of a, uh, of a human 400 years ago. And this is what a modern 1940 jaw can look like. Again, you see how it's constricted here. It's not big and broad like it is here. Now, why is that? So, he went through all these indigenous cultures and found that what was consistent is that they all had pretty good wide jaws. They all did breastfeeding for years. They all ate, the babies ate hard food, they had a hard food diet, uh, like uh, beef jerky and uh, smoked meat and stuff. The kids would start chewing on as soon as they, they could. Uh, they had little or no incidence of malocclusion. So they had fairly straight teeth and not too many degenerative diseases. So basically, he felt that the soft diet 
uh, processed foods, not having a lot of breastfeeding uh, can result in underdeveloped upper and lower jaws and more crooked teeth, basically. So in our Western cultures today, we again, we really work schedules that we have limited breastfeeding. Um, and then we go to bottle. It gives the kids a really soft diet and you know, a soft baby food uh, process. And then we then as they're eating, we can process food, artificial dyes, increases the allergies. You know, there's soft stuff to uh, uh, that melts in the baby's mouth. You want stuff in there. And they have these little bags that you can actually put a little harder food in and have the baby sort of munch on the little uh, harder food and get them used to eating some harder foods first. So we don't see this a lot anymore. A perfectly formed upper jaw from a five-year-old with nice spacing. We like to see, we call this primate spacing. We like to see space in these baby teeth because the big teeth, the permanent teeth are bigger and they need more room. Okay, so we talked about this. Again, the mouse breeding reduces the CO2. Uh, and when this happens, it puts us into fight and flight mode. And so what happens is we get less uh, oxygen to the brain. It's like if you're walking down a dark alley and someone jumps out at you, okay? You automatically go into fight and flight mode. And so now the blood has to go to your, your muscles, okay? Because you're ready to move. You don't need, you don't need your blood going to your, your bladder. And so this is one of the reasons why these kids have bedwetting problems. Um, because they're in fight and flight mode at nighttime because they're having difficulty breathing at that time. It also causes restless leg syndrome uh, because they're moving their legs at nighttime. Uh, and it can be like grinding the teeth and they're not sleeping well. We talked about it increases uh, effects of growth hormone, causes, uh, can cause obesity uh, because of the neural hormones that I talked about. And we're spending billions of dollars to uh, treat all these different things that the kids have, ADHD, we're spending you know, billions of dollars in, in drugs for these kids. Uh, back in 2000, U.S. ranked 32. We dropped down from 24, we ranked 32 in math, uh, 20 in reading. And an interesting, I'm going to go back and see if there's a more recent one to Steve, if we're continuing on this download cycle here. Um, So what can we do? Um, I'll just I'll leave this. This is a, a study that this lady did at Temple University, or let's say the Temple. Um, but she found that basically half these kids that had ADHD actually had sleep disorder breathing problems and it was due to breathing rather than uh, a genetic disorder. And by correcting the breathing, they were able to correct half of those kids with ADHD rather than get him off of the, the, the drugs that they're on. So you know, these are the options that the parents have when the kids have ADHD. You, know, you put them on drugs, they do testing, take them out of school, they do surgery, sleep aids. Um, you know, so you get crowded teeth, do we take the teeth out? Uh, there's a big push now to try to get early intervention to try to develop the jaws and make the jaws bigger so we don't have to take teeth out. Because if you imagine now we take teeth out, that makes a smaller place for the tongue to grow the line, so the tongue gets forced backwards, and that adds to the problem as well. Okay, so we... So we put the kids on drugs, so, <clears throat> so everybody treats everything differently. Uh, and the dentist will treat the malfunctions, uh, the doctors will treat uh, with, with the drugs and everybody would treat their own specialty. But we really have to get to the root of the cause of the problem and try to get these kids treated early. So how can we help as, as dentists? First of all, by noticing and, and what we're doing today is by educating uh, the public so that more people understand and begin to look at these signs and symptoms and, and, get, and get the kids help earlier, uh, screening them. Uh, take courses and educating our parents. Uh, knowing that limited breastfeeding, weak tongue, soft diet, poor health habits, 
like thumb sucking, finger sucking, pacifiers, they can all develop underdeveloped arches. So if we got small arches, that can lead to a compromised airway, that can lead to mouth breathing, uh, swollen tonsils and adenoids, that would lead to your mouth. The tongue is in the wrong position, we get crowded teeth, we have uh, dental problems. Again, this leads to sleep disorder breathing problems. Um, now we're getting restless sleep, we're not getting proper sleeping at night. It can lead into ADD, ADHD, bedwetting, obesity, uh, drowsiness, and all of this thing. So now it has to be caught at an early age. One of the things we can do uh, is really encourage breastfeeding. And uh, as the longer they can do it, the better. Now with some infants, they're not able to latch onto the breast. And this can be due, there's a little muscle right underneath the lip called the labial frenum. And there's a little muscle that goes on underneath the tongue, the gen genial muscle. And if those muscles are really tight, the infant can't latch onto the breast and get properly, uh, improperly breastfeed. And if they can't do that, they get a lot of air and they become colicky. So one of the things that um, mothers should be aware of is to have that evaluated. Um, there's a dentist in Albany, New York, that does this. I went down to his office and he'll bring the infants in and with a laser within basically less than a minute, they'll detach that muscle and they'll show the parents how to, to uh, just massage that so it doesn't grow back. And immediately the baby was able to latch and breastfeed much better just by having that immediate surgery. They, were, it was, they didn't have to go in the hospital. They didn't have to put the baby to sleep. Uh, it was painless to the baby. Um, and it just it was amazed me how that simple procedure could affect the whole life of that child. Okay. The other thing, introduce a hard diet early so the kids are eating and using their jaws and working their jaws, making their jaws grow more properly. If we see them at age four years old, let's say four or five, there's myofunctional appliance or orthopedic appliances that we can get them in and have them start using. They look something like this. This is one type of the appliance here. And another type of appliance is, oops, I'm sorry, is a mild brace appliance. And this has a little tab. It teaches the kids where to put their tongue when they swallow. It teaches to uh, they should get lip sealed when this is in, try to get the lip sealed. And of course, it forces them to breathe through the nose. Uh, it has little holes here, so they can get a little air if they need to there. But um, it also begins to develop their jaws. And you go from one size, and then if they progress through that in six months, you go to the next size, and you gradually increase the size of these. And they have to wear these for at least two hours a day, and they have to be able to sleep with them, okay? Uh, and if they do that, then they can go from looking like this to looking like this. So it can make a big impact on, on their jaws and their teeth and basically, more importantly, how they breathe. So they can expand the dental arches, they can establish nasal breathing, discourage mouth breathing, um, and all the benefits of nasal breathing, train the tongue how to swallow properly, promote proper swallowing, and eliminate bad habits. If you have a, a child or a grandchild that has a problem with thumb sucking, there's a very good book called David Decides that you can read with a child, and they give little examples of how you can uh, try to break that habit. And there's also little things you can put on the thumb. Uh, there's even like a nail polish you can put on uh, that makes it taste really bad. But, uh, we try to do it with a positive reinforcement. Uh, for every night that they go without the, the thumb sucking, I usually try to encourage them to squeeze a stuffed animal or uh, instead of putting the thumb in the mouth. And if they can do that through the night, they'll get a star on their, camp, on their calendar. And if they accumulate 10 stars and they work out a deal with the parents, they get a prize at the end. So I, I find that the positive reinforcement tends to encourage more. Okay, so again, uh, if you can 
breathe through your nose, it reduces the cortisol, it reduces the inflammation. A lot of adults have fibromyalgia, uh, which is an increase of um, uh, cortisol in the inflammatory products in the body. Uh, and a lot of that is from mouth breathing. Um, So this is Michael um, after wearing his, his uh, myofunctional appliance. He was able to look. This is an airway before. This is his airway mm -hmm. after. He brought his jaw forward, his teeth before. Or this is a afterwards, okay, uh, with no braces. So if you get a child that's compliant with the appliances, they work very well. If we have children that are not compliant with the appliance, then we can do what we call fixed appliance. I'm moving ahead here because I'm running over my time, I'm sorry. <laughs> so this just can show the effects of, of widening those arches with some different things that we can use. So these are different types of fixed appliances. And so the child cannot wear the other appliance or they're not compliant. Uh, this is an upper expander, a type of expander. There's all different types. This is called a quad helix that can expand the jaws. So these stay in place and they're activated by the dentist. This one can be activated by the parent by putting a little, um, um, we call it a key, and by turning it, it opens this up a quarter millimeter with each turn. Okay, so this was a young girl that we had. She's got a crossbite in the front, she's got a crossbite in the side. So we made her this little, this is, happens to be a little removable appliance, and this expands this way, it also expands this way. Um, so she was able to wear this and her arch was able to develop and we were able to get a much better result. And she was able to breathe better as a result of, if you imagine if you can bring the roof of your mouth, so you expand your arch and bring your arch down, that opens up your, your nasal airway because the floor of the nose now is lower and you're able to get more air through your nose. So we talked about a lot of this with diabetes, inflammatory diseases, of, of sleep disorder breathing in adults. We usually at the office would uh, give them this little screening. Uh, and you can look at this uh, and when you open up Dropbox. And basically, if you score, um, you know, we, we score this and you, you score either a low, moderate, or high um, chance of having sleep disorder breathing. So if you score it a moderate to high, then I'll write a little note to the physician and we'll set up a uh, breathing test for that patient. Okay, so again, remember, look at the eyes, nose, and mouth. Remember, look for mouth breathing, snoring, okay? Uh, if patient has uh, acid reflux, if the kids are bedwetting or grinding their teeth, it can be uh, related to sleep disorder breathing. If uh, weight gaining, uh, adult onset of diabetes and high blood pressure, all these are related. So, um, you know, Think about a little bit further than just what the symptoms are. I showed you the caudal test earlier. And with the caudal test, you can, uh, if you find that you get some relief with the caudal test, you can buy these over the counter, these little uh, uh, breeze right strips. They also have an Amazon, you can get these uh, cones. And I like the mute here. I don't know if you can see the mute. Now, these are the cones here. But there's also something called mute. And you can get a trial pack, which comes in a small, medium, large, and you can size it to fit your nose best. But what it would do, it would open up your nasal valve, particularly if you breathe in a mirror and you find that one of the valves is very, you know, fives up very little, then this may be helpful for you. It's called a mute. You pick these up for like 10 or 12 dollars. And once you find your size, then you can just buy a box with that size in. Nasal hygiene is really important. We talk about brushing our teeth, but we don't think about cleaning our nose up. Um, um, a neti pot uh, with this, uh, with rinsing on a regular basis, particularly when you first feel a cold coming on, if you rinse your sinuses out with a, a, a solution, you have to use some uh, distilled water, and you put the little packet of salt in it, and you warm it up. Um, I warm it up in the microwave, but make sure it's not too hot. And then you, you flush your nose out with it. Uh, one nostril at a time. And then for maintenance, uh, I find this x is really helpful. It has a xylitol spray in it. Uh, it's not a steroid. 
Uh, the xylitol is a natural, actually, it's, it's a natural sugar from uh, like a, a birch tree, uh, but it kills bacteria. It doesn't promote cavities. Uh, bacteria can't use it to make uh, cavities to form acid, but it does kill the bacteria up in the sinuses in your sinal passes. So if you squirt with your spray, it can it come with a spray here. If you uh, spray, you know, a couple of sprays in the morning, a couple of sprays at night before you go to bed, that will help maintain your sinuses, particularly if you feel colds coming on. Um, again, the buteco breathing to help your exercises. They have a little thing here that you can increase your, your breathing, um, inhaling, exhaling. It's called the breather to help you uh, stop breathing. So again, stop sign. Uh, if you have to yawn, try to close your mouth when you yawn. Uh, try to do quiet breathing. Work on quiet breathing, uh, almost like yoga breathing, as much as you can during the day. Uh, unlock your nose. We already talked about how to do the unlock your nose and uncongest your nose. So that's the directions for that. Uh, if you're coughing, there's a little exercise you can do to help stop coughing. And these are different exercises you can look uh, uh, when you're when you're walking um, to try to increase your uh, controlled pause. On the apps, you can get an app on your phone. Uh, these are different apps you can use to help monitor your breathing. Uh, so if you feel you might have a problem, the first thing you do is you know, see a specialist, see an ear, ear, nose, and throat person that um, you know, specializes in breathing. Uh, have a uh, sleep study done, a polysomnogram. One good one at home is called the watch path. Uh, so ask your doctor about that. There are some other ones on the market today. Um, and the, you can have a study done in the hospital. Uh, a lot of people have a hard time sleeping in the hospital with all the wires hooked up to them. So a watch at home study is a useful uh, way of doing it at home. Try to increase your control pause. If your only control pause is 20 uh, to 30, see if you can increase that and work on that with your breathing exercises. Uh, breathe, eat, and sleep. Exercise correctly. Uh, and that will help your overall health and uh, uh, change your life and change the lives of those around you. So to close, um, Ralph Waldo Emerson had a quote to know, even one life has breathed easier because you will live. Uh, this is to succeed. So in closing, I hope you all can now go home and breathe a little bit better. Uh, look at your family, uh, whether your spouse or your grandchildren or children, and see if you can pick up the problems that they may be having and get them help. Um, if you have a spouse that is snoring a lot, uh, get a sleep study done. They may need to get on CPAP. It will extend their life and will begin to reverse some of those um, cycles and some of those problems that are evolving into more serious problems. So that concludes my discussion. Thank you for your extra time. I'm sorry I went over so much, but uh, uh, there's a lot there. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me or email me at my email address here. And again, today I'll post that and I'll send that and I'll link out to you um, to go back to the slides there. Okay. Okay. Let's see. How do I get back here? <laughs> there you are. Okay. Thank you very much. Good to see everybody again. Gary and Mary, dears, what powerful Delphic spirit. We go to Delphi for inspiration to breathe in. And you have now engendered our path to breathing in better, living better, receiving enlightenment better, incorporating the wisdom of the body better. It was just so powerful and vital. Thank goodness you are doing this work. And I know how you travel far and wide to spread it. And what a gift that is to all English speakers and hopefully in translation one day, the gift of tongues. Please be with you always. So powerful. There are a million questions, I think, in the chat. A lot of them are mine. <laughs> I don't know if, if you want to perhaps answer any now or would you prefer to do that later in writing or ever if you might. Uh, 
I can answer some now, but before I do that, I just want to thank Jean and Rosie for the opportunity. You know, so often we can, I can give this message to dentists or a group of local people, but rarely do I have an opportunity to reach out to so many different people in different countries that they can share that, uh, you know, with their children or grandchildren or spouses. Uh, and, and that's just a, a, a an opportunity they, uh, I'm so grateful for, thank you. I love that you said, there are so many specialists. Well, there might be a lot of specialists, but you are the specialty <laughs> that we need, that you have this focus in a vast practice of many kinds, but that you have hearkened to this most important, like literally bedrock, primal bedrock of the, of the bones of our lives, of the bones of our ancestors, bring them back, bring back that rich round mouth that you showed us so wonderfully to help. Thank you, Gary, so very much. Thank you, thank you. I don't know if we want another moment. That was so brilliant. But this reminds me of Gary walking among us and all others who have helped make the Delphic come to be. Now it is the time that gods came walking out of lived in things. Time that they came and knocked down every wall inside my house. Only the wind from such a turning could be strong enough to toss the air as a shovel tosses dirt. A fresh turned field of breath. Oh gods, gods who used to come so often and are still asleep in the things around us who serenely rise and at wells that we can only guess at, splash icy water on our necks and faces and lightly add your restedness to what seems already filling to bursting our full lives. Once again, let it be your morning gods. We keep repeating, you alone are source. With you, the world arises and your dawn gleams upon every fragment of our failure. So would it be any of us with any of these ills, we convert them now with this breathed in inspiration from you, from Edward, from Zoe, and carry forth with less failure of tomorrow morning. Thank you, darling ones. Thank you, thank you. Oh, closed mouth breathing. Thank you, thank you. Oh. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Rosie. Okay. Thank you. Bye.